continuing our study in the book of Ruth this morning. So if you'll be finding that book, if you don't know where it is, it's a very small book. And so sometimes it's hard to find, but it's Joshua, Judges, and then Ruth. So if you'll find Ruth, we'll be finishing up chapter one this morning. How do you go about making major decisions in life? Decisions that you know will affect your future and the future of those who are closest to you. Decisions like a choice of college, which one to go to or whether to go to it at all. Decisions like the choice of a career, which path to follow. The right place to live, the right person to marry. When to switch jobs or buy a new home. When to move to another city. How do you make decisions like these? I certainly take my time on such major choices, probably because I fear making the wrong decisions and as a result, suffering the consequences. I can never buy a home in today's market. I mean, today you have to put in a bid on a home and be ready to buy it today. And I can never make those kinds of decisions that quickly. I never buy a car the first time I step on the lot. I have to think about it. I have to mull it over. I have to give myself time to make sure I'm making the right decision. I want to think about the path that I'm choosing. I want to weigh the pros and the cons and make the wisest choice possible. I want to be able to pray about my options, hoping that God will give me peace of mind so that I can know I'm on his path, not just mine. I want to be able to talk over these decisions with those that I'm closest to. I want to run things by Tracy and make sure we are on agreement there. And I want to reach out to those who are trusted advisors in various fields, especially if someone else has made a similar choice. Therefore, I can learn from their experiences. I can pick their brain and figure out how they came to the decision, and therefore, it will help me to do the same. I want to gather as much information as I possibly can so that I have all the facts, even though I cannot predict the future, I want all the facts in the present so that I can make the best choice. Now, none of that guarantees that we're going to be right, but it does narrow down our options and help us stay on the right path. I think most of us would claim that we want to be in the center of God's will. We want to know that we are walking according to the way that God wants us to walk, and therefore we take seriously these major decisions. We began our study in the book of Ruth last week, and we only made it through five verses. But I said I was going to speed things up, and so we're going to look at the remainder of chapter one this morning. Now, in those five verses that we looked at last week, we saw three women who were in desperate times. That is, all three of these women had lost their husbands. And in that society, the loss of the husband went far beyond just the grief of a death because it was the husband who provided for the family. And so these three women are in desperate straits. Where are they going to find help? Who is it that is going to provide for them? Should they stay in Moab, where they've been for over a decade now, at least for Naomi? The other two women are from Moab. Or should they pack up and go back to Bethlehem, the place Naomi left? Should they stay together? Or should they separate? Would it be better for them to be together in in these difficult times? Or should they separate and fend for themselves? Well, we're actually going to see this morning that all three of these women choose a different path. That is, they all make a different decision, and only one of those paths is correct. Now, again, I want to state that we know the end of the story. We know how this turns out, and because of that, we can sometimes miss some of the drama that is going on here. These ladies do not know what the future holds. They do not know that God is going to provide for them. And so these are real decisions with real consequences. And of course, this does not absolve them of responsibility, but hopefully we can learn from these three ladies how we can choose the right path for us. And so this morning, there are going to be three paths. And it's my guess that all of us are on one of these paths. And again, there's only one of these that are going to be right. 
Now, I'm going to read the verses not all at once, but I'm going to read them uh, as we look at each point. And so we're going to start with verses 6 through 14 in looking at these three paths. Verse 6, then she arose with her daughters-in-law to return from the country of Moab, for she had heard in the fields of Moab that the Lord had visited his people and given them food. So she set out from the place where she was with her two daughters-in-law, and they went on the way to return to the land of Judah. But Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, go, return each of you to your mother's house. May the Lord deal kindly with you as you have dealt uh, with the dead and with me. The Lord grant that you may first find rest, each of you in the house of her husband. Then she kissed them, and they lifted up their voices and wept. And they said to her, no, we will return with you to your people. But Naomi said, turn back, my daughters, why will you go with me? Have I yet sons in my womb that they may become your husbands? Turn back, my daughters, go your way, for I am too old to have a husband. If I should say I have hope, even if I should have a husband this night and bear sons, would you therefore wait until they are grown? Would you therefore refrain from marrying? No, my daughters, for it is exceedingly bitter for me for your sake that the hand of the Lord has gone out against me. And then they lifted up their voices and wept again. And Orpah kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth clung to her. We're going to start with the path that Orpah takes. And I'm calling this path the sensible choice. Now stay with me, because by calling it the sensible choice, I am not saying that it is the right choice. I am simply saying that based on the circumstances and what they knew, Orpah makes the sensible choice and returns home. We've sung this morning about hope, and we ended last week by talking about that ray of hope. These three women in desperate situations, and then we read verse 6, there's a ray of hope because God has provided for Judah. God has sent food for, to replace the famine. You remember that's why they left Bethlehem to start with, because there was a famine in the land. And now Naomi has heard while she's in Moab that there is now food in Bethlehem. And the way it's worded there lends credence to what we talked about last week, where I said perhaps this is the judgment of God. Because now it is the provision of God. Naomi clearly assigns this to God. And so they begin to go back home, at least for Naomi. All three of these ladies seem to start out on the journey, returning to the land of Judah. But along the way, she urges her daughters-in-law to go back home, go back to their own families and where they were raised. That's where they will find new husbands, that's where they will be able to bear children. That is the sensible choice. She does not know how she's going to survive when she gets back home without a husband. And far worse, all three of them returning with no husbands. Who is going to provide for them? That's a lot of mouths to feed on a very limited budget. And so the prospect of them finding husbands would be easier in Moab rather than in a foreign land, at least from their perspective. So her argument is reasonable. They will have a better chance of being married and having children. She is too old now to bear any new sons, and she doesn't have a husband. Even if she says, I have a husband this night, are you going to wait for me to bear sons and for them to grow up? And when they do grow up, you might just be past the point of bearing children yourself. And so it is clear on a number of fronts, at least from a human perspective, that remaining in Moab was the best option for Orpah and Ruth. But of course, there was one big reason not to. And that's what makes this sensible choice not the right choice. The Moabites, as we talked about last week, were known for their immorality. They were known for their idolatry. They were pagans who worshiped false gods, who of course were not gods. And Naomi is urging her daughters-in-law to go back to their pagan roots she is urging them to return to their foreign gods instead of following her and the real God. She had brought the worship of God to these women. However, imperfectly, as we'll see in a moment, she had been a missionary, to use our terms, in the land of Moab. And yet she is urging them to return to their idolatry. Granted, she wasn't the ideal missionary, 
Her attitude and belief in God were seriously lacking, as we'll see later. But she had introduced these women to the God of Israel and could have brought them with her to Judah to continue worshiping the God of Israel. She even prays for them as she is trying to send them away that God would give them rest and deal kindly with them. By the way, that word translated kindly, remember I brought that up a couple of weeks ago? It is the Hebrew word hesed. It is the first time in this book that that word is used, and it is going to be a very important element of this book. It's translated in the ESV as kindly, but it has a much broader meaning than that. It talks about love, covenant faithfulness, mercy, grace, and on and on we could go. It is very odd that Naomi would pray this as she is sending her daughters-in-law, at least at this point, back to their pagan roots and their false gods. How is Orpah going to find rest? How is God going to deal kindly with her as she returns to her pagan roots? Naomi is also releasing them from any further obligation to her. She is setting them free. Another thing we've sung about this morning. We've talked about how we are free as a nation and therefore uh, the same as we are free in Christ. And here Naomi is releasing them. She is giving them their freedom in a sense from any obligation to her. Now this is the path that many continue to choose in our own day. The path of least resistance. The path of the majority. I mean, if you want to go get along well in life, then you've got to go along with the crowd. You can keep your religion if you want to, as long as you're silent about it. You can identify with the world and be happy and successful. I mean, this is the kind of pressure that many professing believers are under and often give in to it. Go back to your old way of life. Return to your old friends and associates rather than being fully committed to God. This is the easy believism of so many, identifying with God as apparently Orpah had done, but then ultimately returning to her old way of life. She takes the sensible path. Again, that's not the right path, but it's sensible given what she knew, and we never hear from her again. As she turns and walks away from from, uh, Naomi and Ruth, she disappears from the pages of history. We never hear her name again. We have no idea what happened to her. She makes the sensible choice, but that sensible choice comes with eternal consequences. We are going to talk in the weeks ahead about how this story of Ruth is a story of redemption on multiple levels, but not for Orpah. As far as we know, she goes back to her pagan gods. She goes back to her her idolatry, and she dies separated from God in Christ. Now, it's almost safe to assume that you're not on this path this morning. I said at the outset that my goal is to help us see which path we are on. Of these three paths, I'm going to assume that you are not on that path because you are here. On the other hand, you need to be aware of this path because you will be faced with the dilemma in the future of perhaps choosing this wrong way. Just because you're here today and just because you're committed to God today does not mean that you can never become susceptible to straying and going down the wrong path. So the warning and the danger appears to be uh, in order, and we need to make sure we don't follow what I'm calling the sensible path. The second path we need to look at is, of course, the one that Ruth chooses, and it is the path of spiritual commitment. Look at verse 15 through 18. And she said, See, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and to her gods. Return after your sister-in-law. But Ruth said, Do not urge me to leave you or to return from following you. For where you go, I will go. And where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people and your God my God. Where you die, I will die. And there I will be buried. May the Lord do so to me and more also if anything, but death parts me from you. And when Naomi saw that she was determined to go with her, she said, no more. This is a better path. It is the path of spiritual commitment. And of course, these verses are some of the most well-known verses. They are the most well-known verses from the main character of this book. Although I think I can make an argument that Naomi's really the main character, but uh, that's not our topic this morning, nor worthy of our time. 
But Ruth's path is the path of spiritual commitment. Her words to Naomi are no doubt not only the most famous in this book, but they are some of the most loftiest expressions of spiritual commitment to be found anywhere in Scripture. They are familiar to you because you've no doubt been to a wedding where they were used during the marriage ceremony. In spite of the fact that this is not a marriage context, this is not about a husband and a wife, this is about a daughter-in-law and her mother-in-law, we often use it at marriages nevertheless. I doubt seriously if we had it in context that most men would make this commitment uh, to their in-laws, but that's the context. Instead, we have it in our wedding ceremony. This is not only a firm decision by Naomi, it is a forever decision by her. When, uh, by Ruth, I mean, when Naomi urges her again, Ruth silences her. She says, do not keep talking about that. Do not urge me to go back. I am making a firm decision to stay with you, and this decision is going to last forever. The word for clung in verse 14, I know that's in our last section, but the word clung is the the same word that we find in Genesis chapter 2. A man shall leave his father and mother and cleave. That's the same word that we find here. It speaks about a fixed bond that is not to be broken. But it is not just to Naomi that Ruth is clinging, though that's where the commitment begins. She intends to be incorporated into the tribe of Judah and the larger people of Israel. Your people shall be my people. She understands that a spiritual commitment to God means a spiritual commitment to the family of God. Now, that's a pretty simple statement. When you commit yourself to God, you are at the same time committing yourself to the people of God. And yet, that is disregarded by many, theologically and practically, perhaps both. I'm a Christian. I believe in God, but I don't need the church. My relationship with God is going just fine without all of that. In fact, I can grow stronger personally by myself than I can with the people of God. I've had people tell me these very things, not realizing that it is counter or foreign to the whole concept of the New Testament and Christianity. The people of God are messy. They are hypocritical. They fight and they fuss, and all they care about is money. Or in the current environment, every preacher and every church leader is a predator who just preys on women and children. The church just is not a safe place to be emotionally or spiritually. And so they quit the church and claim to cling to Jesus, not realizing that the Jesus that that we find in the New Testament loves the church. In fact, he died for the church. So how can we claim to love Jesus and yet not love the things that he loves? Again, I realize you are here so you have not quit. I also realize that a lot of what I just said is partially true. There are predators in the church. There are hypocrites in the church. There are messy situations within the body of Christ, but we should expect that. Why? Because we're all sinners. I mean, we've all been saved by grace, or at least most of us have, but we're all still sinners, and as a result, there are going to be messy situations in the church. It is difficult to deal with people, even the people of God. And that is part of the reason God puts us together, so that we can grow with one another, so that you can help me grow and I can help you grow. I say all that because I don't want you to walk away the next time someone offends you. Plus, I want you to know that a spiritual commitment includes committing to the people of God, so that you can uh, counter the argument when you hear it from a family member or friend. Ruth understood what many today don't, and that is when she made a commitment to God, it included a commitment to the people of God. Families stick together regardless of how messy the situations might be. But of course, the main commitment here is to God himself. Your God will be my God, Ruth says. The God of Israel is going to be her God, which answers the question that I posed last week, how can a Moabite woman... And the Moabites were forbidden from being in the assembly of the Lord. How can a Moabite woman be the great-grandmother of King David? More than that, how can a Moabite woman be in the ancestral line of the Messiah? 
And the answer is right here, because she commits to, to the God of Israel. She not only commits to him, she turns from being an enemy of God into a friend of God. Now she is a child of God. So she is grafted into the family, to use a New Testament imagery. She is grafted into the family of God with all the rights and privileges that come along with it. And she states the permanency of this decision by declaring, where you die, I'm going to die. And I'm going to be buried there as well. She is not going to return to Moab. She is leaving her people behind. And you need to understand this, that the commitment she makes is not just a commitment to Israel's God, but she is forsaking everything she knew prior to that. She is turning her back on her false gods, her idolatry, and yet even her ancestors, and affirming this commitment with an oath. May God do so to me if I do anything that parts this situation. And the reason her words are remembered and read at weddings is because this is one of the loftiest expressions I mentioned a moment ago. And this spiritual commitment is to the true God, meaning that she is forsaking all else, she is renouncing the gods of Moab because now she knows the God of Israel. So there's two paths. The first path is the sensible choice, at least on the surface, but it's not right. We know Ruth because she makes this spiritual commitment. She's forsaking her idolatry and turning to the one true God. But there is a third path. You say, well, how can there be a third path? I mean, there's only two choices here. Orpah goes back, Ruth and Naomi go to Bethlehem. So it seems like they are on the same path. But there is a third path here, and we find it in verses 19 through 22. So the two of them went on until they came to Bethlehem. And when they came to Bethlehem, the whole town was stirred because of them. And the women said, is this Naomi? She said to them, do not call me Naomi. Call me Mara, for the Almighty has dealt very bitterly with me I went away full, and the Lord has brought me back empty. Why call me Naomi when the Lord has testified against me and the Almighty has brought calamity upon me? So Naomi returned, and Ruth the Moabite, her daughter-in-law with her, who returned from the country of Moab, and they came to Bethlehem at the beginning of the barley harvest. So what's the third path? What is the third choice? Well, it, it, it involves Naomi. And it is the sour return of Naomi. She is still a God follower. She still knows the God of Israel, but she's not very happy about it. She does come back home. She does return to Bethlehem, and she does so with Ruth, but the two of them have very different attitudes. She has already said in verse 13 that the Lord was against her, and the result is her own bitterness. And we see that same thing when she arrives back in Bethlehem, even to the point of changing her name. She is a bitter old woman blaming God for all that has happened in her life. The name Naomi means pleasant, and she is far from that. And so she says, don't even call me that anymore. Call me Mara, which means bitter. This is because God had dealt bitterly with her, according to her own statement, she is blaming God for all that has happened, a lot like many do today, without ever considering that it may be the result of her husband's decision, the result of her own decision, or combination thereof. But all of it has led her to turn away in bitterness from God. There is a place in the Old Testament called Mara. It is a place where Moses brought the people as they were going uh, to the promised land, but they had been in the wilderness for days, and when they got to Mara, there was water, but the water was bitter. And so they grumbled and complained to Moses, as they were so fond of doing. And in response, God turned the bitter water into sweet, or he turned regular water into flavored water, depending on what you like. He makes it drinkable. Now, God is going to do the same thing for Naomi, but she is not there yet. At this point, she is a bitter woman blaming God for all of her problems. I mean, did you notice that she, even that, that she didn't even respond to Ruth's commitment? Did you see that? I mean, we talked about that beautiful commitment that Ruth makes. And after that commitment, the Bible simply says, Naomi was silent. She doesn't commend her. She doesn't rejoice. 
The Bible simply says that she was silent. And when she arrives back in Bethlehem, what does she claim to have? Nothing. She says, I went out full. I've come back with nothing. What about Ruth? I mean, can you imagine her saying that with Ruth standing right beside her? I went out and I've come back with nothing. That's the estimation she gives of Ruth. Ruth is the ticket to her bright future, though she does not know that at the moment. She has been blinded by her bitterness and cannot see the hand of God silently at work in the background. There is a theme that runs throughout Scripture, the theme of exile and exodus. In fact, we could say the whole Bible is that theme. That is, Adam and Eve were, were cast out of the garden. They were exiled. And we continue to await our exodus, our return. But we also see it in other cases, most notably with Jacob going down to Egypt, going into exile empty-handed and returning wealthy. But here it is the opposite. Naomi says, I went out full and I have come back empty. Do you know anybody named Mara? I don't mean literally. I don't, I don't mean is there somebody in your family with the name Mara. But I mean, do you know someone who's bitter? Someone who thinks the hand of God is against them and they've received a, a raw deal in life. They've lost their faith in the goodness of God and now they're filled with self-pity. Woe is me is their recurring frame, f- phrase whether they say it or not. That's the path of Naomi. She hasn't renounced her faith in God. She hasn't turned to idolatry. But she's certainly not happy with her relationship with God. She is a very poor representative because she blames God for all that has gone wrong in her life. She still professes to believe, but her belief is clothed, uh, clouded by her experiences, and she is allowing those experiences to dictate what she believes about God. Would I be wrong to conclude that this path is often chosen today, especially in our part of the country? where there are many people who who are not completely committed. They're not idolaters either. I mean, they're not denouncing God and worshiping some false God, but they're certainly not completely committed to God. They are somewhere in the middle, professing to believe in God and yet not really serving him or serving him for a while, but when they don't get what they want or what they expected, they turn uh, turn away from him and live the way they want to. I don't want to come to the end of my life. Whenever that may be, I don't want to come to the end of my life bitter. And I'm convinced you probably don't either. But it is the choices we make on a daily basis that will determine that. Do we still believe in in a good God whose hand is with us, not against us? I mean, it's easy to see the right path in other people's lives. We're quick to offer advice and tell people what they should or should not do. But yet sometimes we have a harder time choosing the right path for ourselves. Again, my goal this morning is not for you to know the three paths of these three women. My goal is not for you to walk away from here going, well, Orpah did this and Ruth did that and Naomi did something else. My point is for you to examine which path you are on. That's ultimately much more important than what these three women decided. And part of that means looking into our own futures so we can see our current path and where that is ultimately going to take us. Again, this story is about redemption. Ruth is going to be redeemed. and Naomi is going to be redeemed. But Orpah is not. What about you? Have you made a spiritual commitment like Ruth? Have you become bitter like Naomi? The thing about these three paths is that you can always get off one and start on another one. And maybe that's what you need to do today. Maybe you need to turn away from your false gods and make a spiritual commitment to the true God. Or maybe having done that in the past, you need to say, you know, I've steered off course somewhere. I don't know where exactly, and you don't have to, but I've steered off course. I've become bitter and angry towards God, though no one else may know about it. And you need to remind yourself today that God is a good God who has saved you and given you promises that none of us deserve. And you need to put your faith in him once again and trust him for that. Let me pray. 
Father, we thank you that you are a good God. And sometimes that is difficult to see in the midst of our desperate times. We want to be like Ruth and make this spiritual commitment, but we have to admit that sometimes we're more like Naomi. Bitter at the things that you've allowed into our lives, angry at what you've not given us, and failing to see the hidden hand of a good God working behind the scenes. Again, we know the rest of Naomi's story. We know that you are going to provide for her and Ruth and do so very graciously, redeeming them both in the process. But sometimes we can't see that in our own lives. I pray that you would awaken us so that we can see the good hand of a loving God in spite of our circumstances. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand and sing and you respond.